Hello, my name is Jeff Ginger. I am the director of the Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab. And this is a presentation that gives an overview of our Fab Lab and how it works, as well as a lot of the things that we connect to. Uh, this presentation is also available as a book, so you can check it out if you'd like. You can download it off the website, and you, here you can see the table of contents. Uh, a couple of items of note is that we take our own pictures uh, so every photograph in this report is something that's that's real. None of this is stock photography. We do our own work. And so there's many people that have helped us to do this. Uh, I have pulled the report together, and this recording is just a, a dry run. I'm running through it as I see it, so it may be a little informal at times. So to explain what we are, the Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab is an open and collaborative workshop space for computer-driven innovation, design, and fabrication. We enable makers of all kinds, so many kinds of makers, we try to be as open to the community as we can, to imagine, design, and create using open source software, as well as proprietary software, and DIY, not DIY, DIWO, so this is a new term, do it with others rather than do it yourself equipment. Uh, we realize that you know we have a lot of things you could do it yourself, and that is sort of the spirit beneath the lab, but really the bigger spirit is that we're working collaboratively. We help people to create things. Anyway, we do this by working with a local and international network to actively cultivate public engagement. So we're part of the University of Illinois. Public engagement is very important through community-focused art-entrepreneurship. So uh, I'll explain what that is in a minute, but we emphasize that we are not a catalyst or business startup uh, through supporting research and also fostering education. So learning, lifelong learning in a number of different capacities. So Fab Labs are a central player in the maker movement, uh, a social and economic and political movement that is a combination of distributed online learning, accessible computer-driven tools, and do-it-yourself culture. There are many Fab Labs, and they all share similar equipment, software, and ideologies. And in a sense, making has happened for as long as humans have existed. There's been lots of forms of making that, you know, it could be a sewing shop or it could be gardeners. There's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, but nowadays, we also have the Internet where we have a lot of access to knowledge and information about how other people make and do things. So, you know, I to this day do not know how to tie a tie because I don't never really have to wear a tie for academic affairs. And so every time I have to do that, I just go to YouTube and YouTube tells me how to tie a tie. And so that's kind of the concept with a lot of the digital making is that we have lots of different ways of making things and you can learn online and collaboratively from other individuals. Fab Labs can be part of businesses and incubators. Uh, it's oftentimes catalysts is the way they're referred to or startup hubs. Uh, they also are oftentimes found as part of technical training institutes and community colleges. You can encounter them in museums and increasingly in libraries, public libraries particularly, but also academic libraries. And in community centers and government offices, there's some maker equipment at the, uh, in the library in the Depar U.S. Department of State, which I think is awesome. Uh, and then uh, very frequently in universities and schools, the vast majority of fab labs over in Europe are in universities or tied to that in some way. Uh, and then there are also standalone fab labs that are just like standalone maker spaces. They're all connected together through the MIT network. The first Fab Lab started out in MIT around 2005. It was based on a class of being able to design anything you could imagine. And MIT has this really outstanding, like, like multi-million dollar Fab Lab that uh, has become the model for all of these others. And so you, they have a specification and lots of information online about how you can build out a Fab Lab to be part of that network. They have Fab Academy, so you can take a class on how to learn how to use many of the tools and capacities. And a lot of that class is really just about sharing different ideas. Like 50% of the sessions that I watched, like there were people sharing the things that they were doing, the problems that they were facing, that kind of thing. And then there are conferences all over the world. Uh, they, they do a conference in a major world venue each year, and then they have regional conferences. And here you can see just a map of some of the Fab Labs. Uh, there are over 200 Fab Labs worldwide. Uh, we have a map on our wall at the Fab Lab that's this print poster. And when we did it back in 2014, we had to count individually a number of Fab Labs on a, on a page. And now if you look at this, you can see that 51 and 78 bubble on top of Europe. It's just super dense in many areas. There are Fab Labs all over the place cropping up. And just as much as this, there have been maker spaces that are not officially affiliated, but are very similar all over. And we, not only do we have this international network that we try to, to connect to, but we can connect that international network to our local network. So we have the main fab lab at the University of Illinois, but we also have satellite labs at several community locations. And our goal is to connect that global knowledge network to our local network and let them inform each other. So a lot of what we've learned locally can be very important for international locations, especially those that don't have the resources and assets of MIT. 
And then likewise, we can, we, we've had international groups come visit us and run really cool programs. So it's been a very successful model in that way. Our lab, uh, so Fab Lab, if you didn't already know, is short for Fabrication Laboratory. Uh, we are a specific kind of makerspace, but it's just as much defined by its community as its tools. So physically, we're kind of this modern day inventors workshop. We have all this cool equipment like laser engravers and CNC routers, 3D printers, but also other stuff that you might not expect in a Fab Lab, like graphic drawing tablets and digital embroidery machines. Uh, and we collaborate with several grant projects and community partners to provide similar tools at other locations, uh, mostly at public libraries and after school centers. Culturally, however, our Fab Lab is driven by a community of practice, people that we often refer to as makers. And this is a broader term, and we try not to say engineers or designers or something like that that's more specific, because makers come in many shapes and sizes and experience sets, and they generally uh, just, they like to do it. They're passionate about making things. They Oftentimes it's problem-oriented or project-oriented, where they, they create a project or try to solve a problem, but sometimes it might just be fun, for fun, like they just wanted to do art for the heck of it, because it's, it's an enjoyable way to spend your time. Uh, so we have a network of patrons of all kinds, students, teens, families, entrepreneurs, artists, hobbyists, gamers, hackers, engineers, scientists, and the list goes on. And they're all engaged with each other in a variety of different ways. And that's really important to defining our space is that diversity. So these are the sorts of people that might consider themselves makers. Here you see a, a big spread of photos, and these are all different kinds of folks. There are volunteers, there are staff, there are community collaborators, there are people we've worked with on grants. There's a wide variety of sorts of folks that work with our lab, and it's really important to us to have that because it creates a different sort of focus. And we really believe strongly that innovation relies on diversity, opportunity, and meaningful participation. If you want to solve a variety of different kinds of problems, you have to have a variety of different kinds of people in your space. Uh, so we try to invite in stakeholders of many kinds and invite multiple levels of leadership and really try to tackle different sorts of problems and take on different kinds of opportunities than might ordinarily be ta taken on by a similar institution. Uh, functionally, Fab Labs encourage people to become makers by exploring the entire design process. So we're really very interested in design thinking and uh, the whole process of, of coming up with an idea and then converting it into a prototype and then sharing that idea with other people. Uh, but this can relate to all kinds of different areas of study. So we really want to get people into STEAM fields, so science and technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. But, uh, you know, we're also interested in digital humanities and connecting in learners of that sort as well. Organizationally, our Fab Lab is a public engagement program at the University of Illinois. So many people don't know it, but we are a land-grant institution. This is really common in universities in other countries, but in the United States, it's increasingly rare that it operates like this. So even though we are a Research One university, our roots are in serving the state. So uh, we have taxpayers that pay money, and this goes into the university to create a greater opportunity for students in the local state. And we need to do research to give back to the community and do research that involves the community that can help learn from how they operate and what matters to them. So our funding has come primarily from grants and uh, all unit support as well as summer camps. Uh, initially it was, well it's, it's transformed over the years, but initially uh, a lot of the funding to, that kind of helped us to grow into the operation we are was local state grants. We're now looking into larger level NSF funded grants that can help us uh, learn more about how people learn in maker spaces and what that means. Uh, this is just a short infographic. I won't read through all of these things, but there's a lot of ways to measure the metrics of the Fab Lab. I actually really don't like these numbers. It's just, you know, it's the sort of thing that you put in a report. So, you know, we've, we've had an impressive amount of programming. We're open a lot during the week. We have lots of active staff and volunteers. Many of them are women. Uh, we have tons of youth. Last summer, we were in uh, doing summer camps all over the state, not just local, but, but uh, you know, in Peoria and then Southern Illinois region. Uh, and we, we get a lot of use out of the tools. We try to maximize the amount of effort. And we have these open hours, but also a pack schedule with specific workshops and events. Uh, and, and we also do a lot of outreach to other organizations, even across the world. So for us, community partners are not just words on paper. So we don't want to just say, oh, you know, we did a program with this person. We must clearly be partnered with them. You know, we have differing levels of partnership and we have differing levels of engagement. So uh, some of our strongest partners are the libraries in town and after school centers. And we've done work with them over many different years. But we've also worked with the University of Illinois in extension, pardon me, which has allowed us to work with all kinds of new organizations that we wouldn't have otherwise encountered. 
And for us, partnership will usually involve, we, we set up a miniature fab lab at their site, and we have at least one person from their organization and one person from our organization that are tied to each other. So we have a staff person that's going to run programming there regularly, and we have some staff person from there that's going to be there to help sustain it. So and this is contrary to a lot of community informatics or development uh, ICT 4D kinds of operations where they, what I call airdropping of tech, we just kind of drop technology in, in a place and you know, just expect it to get used. And I know that, uh, you know, there, there are stories on TED Talks and TED Talks that you can find that are, oh, you know, we stuck a computer in the wall and suddenly the youth knew how to program and hack and type English. And we haven't really found that to be a very successful model is that we really only think things take off if there's human infrastructure support to help enable learning with that thing. So it's great to spread technology and give access and opportunity, but the digital divide is really only one part of this. Is that it's really largely about community development and forming of networks and, and rearranging of resources. And we do a lot of that through our partnership. So here are some pictures of our outreach in action. Uh, I, you know, the long version of this presentation, I can go through and read each one of them. But, you know, we do lots of events. So, you know, that might be like a makeathon where we have lots of groups coming together. You can see in the upper left there, uh, it was a makeathon where students had to invent uh, solutions to accessibility problems for the elderly. And we partnered with a living assisted home. Uh, but we also do lots of tables. You can see the, the tables on the bottom there uh, or a quad day where we show off cool uh, activities and things with maker equipment just to raise awareness. Uh, and then we also have traveled. Uh, this is becoming increasingly something where we would travel to other organizations and share knowledge and we learn about what they're up to and tell them about what we do. So that's a big component of the programming we do. We have some recently funded grant projects. These have been the ones that have sustained us in the past couple of years. So Digital Literacy for All Learners is one of the grants that allowed us to start up community locations all around town to really put a lot of FabLab Maker equipment in those sites and then also have people attached to it. Uh, this has been in partnership with the Graduate School of Library and Information Science, which is where a lot of the people that have worked in those sites have come from. And many of them have actually stayed on to continue to this day. One became a librarian at actually one of the library sites, and uh, others have just been involved in supporting those sites over the years, which has been really great. Uh, and then the Digital Innovation and Leadership Grant has been one of the major venues for for our operation as we started out with this digital literacy for all learners where we did these little community site operations to locally and we said okay what if we made a big mobile fab lab and we did this all over the state you know and so we worked with some state partners and we actually ran summer camps in many locations and connected uh, faculty and university resources to all sorts of locations around the state to really form the and build capacities in those locations so we would teach teachers how to do the kinds of fab lab workshops we do and then they would continue to run those operations there without us and we would leave them then or we're about to leave them in the next month equipment to continue doing that uh, the Alaskan Fab Lab grant this is actually one of the oldest ones it, it was, was initially uh, awarded I believe in 2010 or 2011 and uh, the idea is is could we put a Fab Lab in Alaska where you don't have a lot of good internet connection and you know there are, there are issues with the community where they, they have to basically fish or be in natural resources for a living and so there are issues with social isolation and depression and suicide and we opened up a fab lab and a boys and girls club there and it's been an interesting metric because they have to be more self-sufficient there you know if a snow plow breaks they can't just like fly another one in on an airplane easily like you know they have to or you know they can't necessarily get a design on the internet when the internet's not a, a regularized part of their life because it's kind of unstable so we we wanted to put a fab lab there and see how the community could react to it and help form it and so we've had a little bit of partnership with them up there in that grant as well and then we've been working with a number of with education and the center for teaching and learning to open up several new grants to think about how can we learn more about how makerspaces encourage learning or shape learning and this is something that I think is going to drive a lot of our future research and funding. So our Fab Lab is the second oldest building on the University of Illinois campus. It used to be this, this really kind of crazy place where they'd keep horses and it's had many roles over its years. And it's falling apart, but that's actually kind of part of the charm and why it's wonderful is that you know, we can do anything we want to it. We can change it. We can mess with the layouts. It's, it's sort of this, this in process space and it exemplifies that. And I think a lot of starting out fab labs have trouble because their, their fab lab will be so clean and perfect that nobody, you know, wants to change anything or mess around with anything. And that can actually make it for an uncomfortable environment. And it's really important that people be comfortable when they're innovating or trying to come up with new ideas. Cause they'll, there's research to suggest that if you feel better, you'll work better. Uh, and we have here also a picture of the east side of the computer lab. There's, you know, a sort of flexible computer lab space. Uh, we have a textiles area, which is directly across from 3D printing. And so we like that because there's a table between them. And you have these groups that might not otherwise interact, interacting. 
Uh, there's laser engravers and cutting that area in a flexible, so what we call the milling room, but it's really just a multi-purpose central room. Uh, there's there's also another classroom not pictured here on the other side. We have materials a materials closet to get people started on projects, and we also have an electronics and diagnostics and fabrication room. Our fab lab is based on on about it's about a one hundred thousand dollar footprint of a fab lab, so it you know it just barely meets the MIT spec. And uh, mostly we actually emphasize having more material, more machines of fewer and smaller types. And the Fab Lab spaces at our community sites uh, vary a lot in how they look. I have some pictures in the other presentations uh, about how those look, but uh, they're more like the $10,000 model. Of they'll have like a laptop computer lab and they have carts that roll things out that have smaller versions. And they'll create temporary spaces in audit an audit auditorium or in a, uh, a community center space or a teen zone. So we obviously have a bunch of tools in the lab. Like I mentioned, there are laser engravers. Those are very popular. But we also have electronic cutters, uh, and those are really great for just cutting apart paper or sticky vinyl, but also things like fabric and, and uh, in, like electronic or conductive tape. Uh, we have a number of digital embroidery machines. They're hybrids, so they can work as sewing machines to do textile projects. There are larger experimental 3D printers as well as small 3D printers, uh, Connect 3D scanners and other kinds of 3D scanners. Uh, there's a powerful multimedia workstation space. So we've got a poster printer and then graphic drawing tablets to go along with that. Uh, we have some wood shop tools for basic wood shop uh, construction, some CNC routing machines, uh, electronics diagnostics, and the ability to fabricate PCB boards, and then a lot with small board electronics. And some of those are also wearable, which are not pictured here, but you know, ones that can be integrated into clothing and that sort of thing. And really, one of the things that I want to emphasize is lots of spaces get very obsessed with laser engravers, CNC, and 3D printers. Those are all great tools, but I think the most exciting projects are the ones that combine many tool areas. You know, it's not about, you know, does your 3D printer print bigger than somebody else's? It's more about, you know, what can you uniquely do combining these different things in a creative way that's never been done before? I really like that as a concept beneath our space. So. Uh, and then, like I said, we try to have a lot of copies of these tools so we can run a, a workshop. So rather than have, you know, one single big machine that only benefits one person, we want to have 15 little like electronic cutters so we can have 15 kids all learn that activity at the same time. So uh, this, there's a showcase of all the different kinds of things we do. Uh, you know, education is obviously our most important mission. And you can see lots of pictures here, but we try to bring in people of all ages. I like to say that we work with ages 8 to 25, so at the very tail end of K through 5. And we, we don't work with younger kids, largely because they typically don't have the patience to sit down and work with a computer for more than half an hour at a time. And at younger ages, more of your outcomes are about social, emotional kinds of outcomes, which are very valid and very important. But we really like it when kids can walk away with something they've really made that matters to them, and also walk away with a skill that they can repeat or use in future circumstances circumstances and that's a lot harder to do with younger age kids so we focus more on junior high up through high school uh, we also run college level classes so you can see lots of different pictures here of we really just try to work with different community groups and people at all ages uh, through classes and also open lab so here uh, just a bit of a showcase on youth engagement we've been running summer camps for a while now and we do these really cool summer camps where it might be something as simple as like learn to sew or something as complicated as, you know, building a robot to, to be a, a, in a competition or getting robots to try to dance together. Uh, and we've done these all over the state. Sometimes they're, they're uh, you know, it's youth engagement at like a fair where kids are just walking up for five minutes. Sometimes it's like a full, you know, week long camp that happens and you get kids that are learning there. And then we also have teens that are learning to teach those kids at the same time. And it's with media production as well as digital fabrication and sometimes things that are not digitally fabricated. So, you know, we might do screen printing that, you know, the idea could come from the computer, but perhaps most of it is done offline. So we really like that fluidity of different kinds of learning types, you know, purely on a computer, purely off a computer and some mixture between. That's okay. And then we also have a lot with continuing ed. So I run a variety of university classes. These are mostly pictures from my classes, but uh, we also have other classes that come into the lab that we'll host, that will build projects. So uh, we've had communication students in there, industrial design, library and information science, uh, it's some writing across media, all kinds of different areas that will come into the lab. And I teach a class on the design of usable information interfaces. So uh, we iterate through things like video game design or learning how the, the what the black box. So, you know, ripping open computer parts to see what's inside of computers and learn how they work uh, or programming Arduinos, all kinds of sort of introductory design methods to help students get to think about how do we make it easier to use all these technologies? You know, what what is it that enables us to use them?
Uh, we also have a makerspace class that's hosted purely in the lab where students learn to use all the different tools and then at the end of it create a really cool project and they also have to run an event a workshop for somebody in the community or a group of, of students or learners in the community and then we do a lot of training of educators so teaching teachers and i don't actually really like the word training but sometimes that's the way it comes off is you know they come and they learn how to use a tool our preferred method though really is we go and we do a workshop with some educators and then in the afternoon the educators run the workshop with some other audience and there we're, we're there with them to back them up so it's this two-part two-step piece where they they learn more holistically and then they can develop lesson plans and specifics beyond that uh, and it's, a lot of it's informal education, so it's not just teachers, but we get people like librarians and 4-H educators and people that are engaged in a variety of levels. Another showcase is we do do curriculum development. So uh, when I was volunteering or working with one of the, the community sites at their Banner Free Library, uh, they, they had sort of a problem. There were lots of kids who would come in and play Minecraft and uh, they'd get mad at each other in the game and make a big, you know, they'd have behavioral problems that would be start in the game and then kind of eke into real life. And I, you know, saw this and instead of saying, oh, you kids, you shouldn't do this and getting mad at them, I said, okay, what's this game? I'm going to learn the game. Let, let me become one of your, part of your world. So I learned Minecraft. I learned how to play the thing and I quickly discovered that there's a lot you can do with Minecraft. You can actually design models in that game and export them for 3D printing. So it can be a tool for digital manufacturing. And then likewise, the picture in the lower left there, you can actually take 3D scans or existing 3D models and import them into the game. And the more I learned about it, there's lots of different things you can do. The kids actually helped me to, we created a collaborative server together. They learned how to design the server and pick out what modifications they wanted. And uh, it became sort of a communal governance effort. And they learned that if they work together better, they, they will actually succeed in the game more rather than just killing each other and fighting a lot. You know, a lot of young men don't know how to, how to handle issues of violence and, and conflict. And so I was able to act as a mediator. So rather than being the authority that tells them what not to do, I became a peer that worked with them to recreate the environment and empower them to change it. Uh, you can also see that redstone computer down there. That's uh, one of our, our teens has actually become an instructor. We have a 14 year old that's more talented than most college students I, I meet who can build all kinds of really cool circuit logic in the game. It becomes a way that you can learn other kinds of programming. And then I also like digital storytelling. There's no picture here that has to do with it, but you can learn to program in the game to create these digital interfaces and storytelling experiences. And we've actually grown this now into grants where we're doing science simulation with Minecraft and more. So this is a really great example of how, you know, we might start out just playing around with a tool, something that initially seemed kind of like a problem and grow it into a really productive and interesting experience just by committing to it and tr trying to learn how it works from the, the bottom up. Uh, I also really emphasize this art plus entrepreneurship. So there are so many catalysts that are like, we have 7,000 projects that have been funded by $7 billion of venture capital. And look at how great we are because we make tons of money. We don't really care about that. We're not really interested in revitalizing the economy of a country. We're not well positioned to do that. I'm not going to expect, you know, fifth graders or junior high kids to invent the next everything. We're not trying to create Mark Zuckerberg's. But we are trying to help artists and entrepreneurs that are on a small scale, people who are really passionate about their work. They might do it for fun. They might sell it on the side. They might just, you know, go to arts and crafts shows, people that might be struggling artists, people that are not, you know, they might be just trying to get people to think about the world a little bit differently rather than try to change the entire world. So we have lots of artists who are also entrepreneurs that come through our space. And you can see pictures in here of like people that come up with, you know, simple products that we can refer to other catalysts to take them to market. But people might just do like jewelry or come up with a clever idea. Uh, I, I really like the, the bag in the lower left there. It's a solar panel bag. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that I don't think would emerge out of a, a typical engineering dominated catalyst space where, you know, this was, you know, you could take any bag that you've sewn and, or, or bought and integrate a solar panel and battery circuit into it and make something that's a little bit more utility oriented. And that, that sort of add on DIY kit thing has been really popular in places. And it doesn't necessarily sell for a million dollars. The whole point is it's like the Etsy thing is it's just customized for specific individual users. And we really like that. Uh, so an example of how art can also happen is it doesn't even have to be a product. So you can do things just to have an interesting experience. So this is the Neuromaker, and this was made by an industrial designer who is a graduate student and one of the people that helped to found the lab. And the Neuromaker was a milling machine, but it also could connect to read EKG waves. You put this little headset on and it would uh, sort of zoom around and make uh, squiggles or circles or mill something out depending on what you were thinking. And it was this play on the idea of you have these ideas in your head and you just want to physically create them. How can you do that? How can we aid that process? And he just made this thing that was a really fun interactive exhibit. 
It wasn't a powerful tool capacity. It wasn't necessarily a product. It was just something fun to make a statement about how we think and how we design. Another example is this was a kickstarted project. So you can see she, she got up to about $9,000 there. And this was to kickstart a children's book. So Judy actually designed a lot of this book using the tools at the Fab Lab. She created a lot of the Kickstarter rewards there at the Fab Lab. And this, this has helped to make her artist career happen is that she's, you know, she's not founded Facebook. She's founded her own life, which is full of a very diverse set of experiences and opportunities that have been related to art. And we really have liked having Judy in the space as one of our contributors and staff. Uh, also, being part of the University of Illinois, we do support research. Uh, we try not to compete with the really big research fab spaces. Like, you know, we're not going to be able to, like, fabricate your indoor river, but we can do small things. So I already mentioned the Minecraft thing. You can see up there, that's an interactive watershed model where you could run around in Minecraft and adjust the environment and see how it would affect the water in real time. And this was a, get, a way just to do simulation with kids in Engineering Open House, but they could think about how can they affect this and how, how do they program the different variables. You can also see we were trying to automate the scanning, 3D scanning of plants so that rather than measuring thousands of leaves of plants, we could figure out how to take a picture and just measure from point to point in a vertical mesh or in, in a, in a uh, from vertex to vertex in a mesh rather. Uh, th there's also a little acrylic Arduino sensor that you could drop in a river and it would give you data about you know water flow patterns. Uh, the the <laughs> scaffolding in the middle left there is actually a 3D printer frame, but they stuck a camera to it cause, so it could zoom around and take pictures of bugs very quickly. Uh, we've had a variety of other interfaces and things that have been developed in the lab. So a lot of it's graduate student work and small time projects, but it's, it's a space where we can aid them in creating those research prototypes. One of my favorite examples of those prototypes is the dust we know. This is an example of an Internet of Things object and a, uh, a, a citizen science kind of thing. So there are multiple areas that were used for this. So it's laser cut acrylic. That's the press fit box maker that was used to make that. There's an Arduino board with a wireless sensor inside of it, so small electronics. And then there's a 3D printed housing for the dust sensor that's also inside. So, you know, combination of several areas. And there were a number of these, and you could distribute them all throughout the Fab Lab and the, or any other lab. And they would collect data on dust and then report this data back up to the internet so that you could collect that and aggregate it all to, over time to gauge you know, the healthiness of the environment. Is the dust level dangerous? Is this something that we have to worry about? Does it change throughout different times of the day? And uh, this, this uh, creator actually later then started attaching sensors to drones and collecting all kinds of different data. And he's a really a big fan of empowering citizens to collect their own data. You know, you could think about the Flint, Michigan water issue that happened lately. And if you had to petition your government to convince them that your, your drinking water was not healthy, well, if you could use a sensor and a cheap electronics board like this, you might be able to collect your own data to make a better case. And so we like enc encouraging that kind of research as well as the university research. So finally, every photo has a story. I've kind of highlighted a few of them throughout this talk, but you know, we have a website with thousands. We do, we do try really hard to just take lots of photos. It's really important to promoting our space. And so, you know, if you find a photo and want to know what it's about, let us know. You can email us and we'll, we'll figure out a story for that photo. Uh, just some of the ones in the space here, you know, in the upper left there, uh, that's a board game. We have a board game group a competition where you can build different parts of board games at the Fab Lab. Uh, the upper two actually are so so uh, a child that's very advanced for his age who's created a multi-layer art piece there uh, and then the upper right was in a similar camp actually it's those are paper automata is you pull the tail of the elephant and its trunk could curl and you can do these kind of engineering projects with just paper uh, in the middle left there it's just uh, some of our staff having fun hanging out in the lab is that they're part of the space in that way too is their makers and you know they have a job but their job is fun most of the time and that's how we get them to positively engage with the space the little whale there that's colorful. Uh, you know, most circuit boards are really boring squares or rectangles. And, you know, nobody said that your circuit board has to be boring shaped, right? And this is the kind of thing that happens in the Fab Lab is that we change things because we can. We want to make it a little more fun or interactive or invest our uh, some personality in something. Uh, there we have that tube scene that's sort of a, a cinema piece that was created by little kids. Uh, graphic drawing tablets in the lower left to do animation. Uh, and then uh, the hard drive guitar, that's actually e-waste music. So that's one of our staff members there. He created this guitar that you could play that. You could sort of swish around on the hard drive spindles and it would make noise on a computer somewhere. And this was to recycle, you know, things that were never going to be used again to make them into fun instruments. And then the lower right there, uh, that I believe that was part of one of the sewing camps. So girls learning to teach each other and do sewing in that, that moment. 
So I've gone over a lot of things in this presentation. I just barely brushed on topics like funding or how we work out our spaces or you know what our programming looks like. If you're interested in more of that, our website where you've probably found this video has tons of information. We have a guide to starting how to set up small community maker spaces, ones that are maybe more at the $10,000 mark rather than the MIT model of the $100,000 mark and a little bit more community oriented and some more information on leadership and that kind of thing that you might need to set up or start out your space. So please go check that out. Out, and you can email us at communityfablab at gmail.com to ask us questions about how we do this or why it matters or you know we, we're really really happy to share information and learn about what you're doing too uh, we're doing more to collect and present curriculum that's also an available resource on the site so that if you're looking for you know how to do these kinds of programming programs we're trying to share that too thanks